Hello everyone, welcome to Dora to Delay Masterclass Series. Uh, it's wonderful to be joining all of you. Today is a very special day uh, in many different sense. We have a snowstorm here in, the, in East Lansing. So we we're fortunate that we're doing this class uh, remotely. Actually, it's a blended class today. Um, our wonderful guest artist Julian Rocklin is going to join us in a second and um, some of the MSU students are preparing to perform for Julian and he's in uh, uh, he's going to coach two students um, who are ready to perform at the Murray Hall here at Michigan State University uh, we had wonderful seasons in the fall we had some live classes with uh, wonderful guest artists Midori, Vadim Glusman, Vladimir Fang, uh, um, Rohan De Silva who came actually here and did live performances and live master classes and today we have uh, this kind of blended session and I'm really looking forward talking to Julian between the students and uh, Julian please uh, you can com come in right now we're waiting for you hi everybody it's wonderful to see you Julian it's a great pleasure and honor thank you for having me so where are you joining us from? Secret location. I'm on holidays with my wife. Ah. Getting, working on our suntans and actually studying my very first opera, Figaro. Wonderful. Marriage, so, so. You, you're going to conduct, not, you're not going to sing, right? No, no singing for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I, I wouldn't be surprised because you're doing so many things and wonderfully doing. This is something one should... Uh, just admire in your capacity as a violinist, violist, uh, chamber musician, director of the festival and conductor. And it's really that you're capable of doing all those things in the very highest level. So I, I congratulate you and I'm looking forward to see you teaching as well today. Absolutely. Thank you, Dima. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's uh, really wonderful uh, to be invited to do this and I can't wait. To hear, I think we have some Strauss and some Copland. Yes, so we're ready for our first uh, duo. It's going to be Yumian Lee violin in Le G piano performing Richard Strauss first two movements. So whenever you're re ready, let's uh, let's start this. And I'm going to mute myself and disappear. Thank you. 
Fantastic. So, dear Yun Miao, you are a fantastic violinist, as you know, but it's always important to hear it. And uh, absolutely wonderful playing. I lost your picture again. Is it when I talk that I don't see you? You can see me, yeah? Yeah, we can see Julian. Perhaps if if you would be in the gallery view, not on the speaker view. On the gallery view, you could see everyone. Now I can see Yun Miao, yes. So, dear Yun Miao, now we have this Strauss Sonata, which is a big, massive piece and one of the great sonatas for violin and piano. He writes a lot of pianissimi, a lot of very clear things that are written in the music, first of all. So the first thing that is very important for us is to respect the composer's wishes, because somebody like Strauss we cannot call. So what I hear, you have a beautiful sound, beautiful technique, uh, a few ideas I'm going to give you on the way as we keep, you know, we have around 45 minutes, so of course it's a master class, so we don't have time to discuss everything, but in my opinion, for what I hear, and again, this is just uh, everything digital and through video, so I I'm not in the hall listening to you, but for me, everything sounds forte, mezzo forte is, is the softest nuance, what I hear from you. Mezzo forte, forte, fortissimo. It's very healthy, very solid playing, but you are not telling me a story. What for me is very important, especially in sonatas, even more than in violin concertos, is to create a very intimate dialogue, like in chamber music, in the string quartet. I'm sure you do a lot of uh, chamber music. When you know which voices to bring out, when to listen to the piano, also for the piano to go much softer when the violin is in the leading position and has a very important line. I think that the conversation, you don't need to look at each other because obviously you are a duo and you are very well played together. But I, I, would, in, I would invite you to, have, to not be afraid to explore all the colors, all the dynamical ranges, much more exaggerated. Don't be afraid, don't be inside this box of very healthy, wonderful violin playing. It's not enough. I want to get to know your language. You need to tell me a story. You need to hype, hypnotize me. So that when I go to sleep and I wake up tomorrow, I still have your performance in my, not just in my ears, but that I say, oh my God, this was something special. You need to take me on a journey. Anyways, now I spoke a lot and it, I don't want to speak too much because it's very general, but it's very important because uh, we are sometimes afraid to really show what we want to, you know, to speak, to tell something in life. I'm sure you tell a lot of very interesting stories to your friends, to your family, to whoever you want. I don't think that you are an introvert person, not the way that you play. But still, can we start it again? And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop you and give you a few ideas on the way. I, have a, I haven't played this piece since my teenage years. So um, don't expect me to, you know, to play it. But, uh, you know, we start here 
Don't reveal everything immediately. Keep it inside. The climaxes are yet to come. The beginning should be very much from a distance. These accents are very, very soft and tender. Let's try it from the beginning. Sorry, sorry. What is the name of your wonderful pianist? Dima, can you help me? B E L E Bel Bay Belly. Can somebody help me, please? Just Lee. <laughs> Lee. Okay, I call you Lee today. Dear Lee. Before you and my enters, go more away, disappear, softer. Yeah? You start powerful, it's wonderful, and then have some imagination. Take a little bit of time, make a diminuendo, and let Yun Mai enter. Five times softer, five times less, less, less. Don't impress us with your sound. We know that you have an amazing sound. Try something with the bow speed. Bow speed, vibrato, colors. I want to hear you play colors. Much, much better. Lee, you can be even softer and take even more time. Small ritenuto. As if you're thinking what... And then you might, please. In Strauss's music, like in a lot of Viennese music, one thing is to play rhythmical, the other thing is to have a pulse. I don't want you to play rhythmical. You play too exact. Tam, tararararam, pam. It's very, very free. Play with the agogic. Sometimes a little bit earlier, sometimes a little bit later. Yeah? Don't, we need the pulse that you have, but not exactly in rhythm. It's a big difference. Last time, sorry for interrupting. But 
You know all these notes. The small notes. You only vibrate the comfortable notes. I want you to vibrate small vibrato, but sing. You know, for example, you don't vibrate. You just do the comfortable notes. It's a state, it's not separate every note vibrato, but it's a state of mind, yeah? All the small notes, they need to speak, yeah? Try to vibrate every note, unless you decide consciously, which is absolutely your right, as a color, not to vibrate. But that has to be a conscious decision. Otherwise, I am very much against just vibrating the comfortable notes. So especially the small notes, pay attention, yeah? Let's do, maybe not from the beginning. Let's do from here. And on. Yeah, all the small notes. The whole bow on the high uh, B, is it, what is it, B, B flat, you play, I need the most bow on the second note, the second note, if you have two notes, even you want the top note to sound powerful, Save the bow. Don't give all the bow. You can make an intense vibrato, but we need Also the second note is important. Same place. of all these runs, yeah? Go soft already, prepare the next, prepare the second theme.
No boat changes. I don't want to hear. Da -da 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 da 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 No boat changes. It's a big legato. I mean, keep your boings, but when when you start a new bow, don't give bow. Save your bow. Every single new bow, save it. Don't give bow. And the first C note. Yeah, sing it. Take your time. Last time, and then we continue. the C. You, we need about 27 different colors. Save your bowl. Do you see? You have to play with bow speed and with vibrato, not the same vibrato. Yeah. Or you can go up to the D string, doesn't matter, yeah? You need to be a poet. A poet on the violin. You can do it. And the last time. Take time, nobody's rushing you here. Much softer. but don't do too much please you mind it's not so much yet yeah it's only it's a crescendo but not really this this it's a different character, uh, totally different character. Um, you know, there is also 200 different kind of forte. It's up to you. I feel in this, it's uh, much warmer and much less important. Don't take a forte as a forte like this always, yeah? Let's try. 
Just the piano, the piano solo before your tea. -ra 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 -ra. starts a little bit something nervous. Yeah, but in piano. Espressivo, a little bit nervous. Yeah, what is happening now? Some kind of a tremolo feeling. Let's try this. in this pianissimo. What is it? How much bow? Exactly. Save the bow and then travel without any crescendo. And the last two notes, small vibrato. Lee always, Yun Mai, always leave enough bow for the last two, three, four, five notes. If you have 12 notes, don't play, don't waste it all. Then it will seem that you have an endless amount of bow and lungs, lungs. We need lungs, especially during COVID. We need our lungs. Please. No, 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 too much bow, too much bow. Too much bow in the beginning. What about all the eight notes? I am personally maybe born 40 years too late. You know what I, what, what I mean? I love the way that 
people were singing on the violin. Like Milstein, like Schering, like Menuhin, like, you know. They were singing and every note had a special meaning. Of course, we don't forget the big phrase, but there is a lot of notes that are just wasted. Sorry for being so harsh. <laughs> I don't mean it in a bad way. Don't waste one single note. This music is so special. Let's try it. like a little can I say like a little fart or is it incorrect it's mm. yeah much more bow and this accent more soft misterioso And the second one, the coming one, different. Yeah, always different. Let's do the first for the piano, one bar before. Pianissimo. I should not even hear you. Ta -da. Ta -da, pa -pa -pa. Start from the string always. Always start from the string, not from the air. Crispy, crispy duck. Nothing happening. The most tender what you can do. Nothing. Don't show off at all. Now, and please, in the high note, the high B flat, 
Also change the vibrato at some point, make it very narrow and very quick. And then the first B, the down, when you go, ba -bam. the small note with vibrato. One more time, very nice sound it was. my bravo when you have molto espressivo la -di -ra -di -ra 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 -ra. and then you have again the same you need to take it even more because it continues the first time is a small fra uh, uh, fragment Maybe start a little bit, step on the piano, a little bit earlier, the E, natural. And then mezzo forte, so maybe for you mezzo piano. Let's do this whole thing from here. to this forte yeah so maybe a little bit it's not an accelerando but a little bit more direction and then this chord must be really strong this is the first time when i would really recommend it also has a double bar yeah so it is significant yeah let's lead to it flat intonation be careful here yeah be careful and also i can hear a lot your bow changes don't 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 a little bit higher everything be careful here it's the whole first movement when you have this this runs it's a little bit flat the intonation and it would be nice if it seems like legato like one bow let's play the double bar <laughs> here please exaggerate this is so important
Debussy, Ravel, whatever you want. Impressionist, flautantissimo, pianissimo. There is, I need to hear a pianissimo. I want to say I don't hear you. But I hear you too much. Little bit more sweet, sweet and giving up, less powerful. Yeah? Fade out. Beautiful theme, yeah. Just a moment. You know, after long notes, the first note, the short first note, this is the most important because the long note will always sing and be beautiful. But afterwards, you are, you are forgetting, yeah? Now. The most important thing is when you go on stage, don't try to prove anything because the moment you try to prove, look how great I am, it's wrong. You will not impress anybody. But if your goal is not to impress, but make a dialogue with Strauss, with Lee, with the audience. Try to imagine that you are really in a chamber or at home or, you know, I don't know, if you have a little child and you just play for the child. Much smaller. This is the secret. We don't need to impress anybody because everybody knows immediately that you are a wonderful violinist. So I want you to go more intimate, more inside, especially with a theme like this. Let's try this one, yeah? Thank you. 
I think it's enough for today. Bravo. It's a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. It was a wonderful session. Very intimate. It's uh, what we need in this snowy day here in Michigan. Listen, I wanted to ask you, so you mentioned that you, you haven't really performed this piece in a long time. Oh my God, don't ask me. I think I must have been, I'm 47 now, so it must have been in my early 20s. Yeah. It's such a beautiful piece, but it hasn't been, you know, performed very often these days. And uh, I would like to also try to schedule this more because it's a, we will bring it, it, it grows on you. You know, at some point you hear some of the recordings, it sounds so powerful, so amazing, and you don't want to do anything. But the way you interpret this piece, it brings so much intimacy. And I, I, I really like this approach. And I hear it also. There's so much nuances. And if it's just played straightforward, you know, you just pass everything like an, on a speed train. Well, I mean, of course, we want to keep we want to keep going. We don't want to get stuck in details and all the time stop. So that's what I was trying to to convey to to you and my, we, of course we need the flow and this piece is flowing and the first movement is amazing because it just goes in one but we should never forget that there are these moments and without losing the pulse we can still play around it so it's always to find the right balance and your own truth absolutely I wanted to ask you, since you're doing so much conducting these days, and uh, how has it changed uh, your uh, your way of violin playing? I'm sure it has an, an incredible impact on your interpretation. Uh, Dima, it's a wonderful question. It's uh, by now 65% of all of my concerts are conducting, so I really somehow without planning it in any way but i must say i have been taking lessons and studying really thoroughly studying conducting for over 15 years now and uh, i never thought that it would go that path that it would sort of lead me um but yeah it somehow naturally developed and uh, how has it influenced my violin playing i mean the 35 percent uh, that I that I play on the violin, they are much, in a way, much more special and much more dear to me than they ever were before. Because before I was a fiddler, and I mean that's the only thing I can do. <laughs> and, and then came the passion to, to to the viola because actually my favorite instrument is the cello. My dad is a cellist, and the, I'm crazy about the cello. I know the cello repertoire much better than the violin repertoire. But um, being a violinist, the closest you can get to a cello is the viola. <laughs> and actually, when I went in the early 90s, when I went to take lessons with uh, Pinker Zuckerman, he, he was the one who told me, if you want to be a good violinist, you need to play the viola. At that time, I didn't understand what he meant. But uh, yeah, he made me do it. And um, I couldn't even read the clef back then. That was in 94, I think. And uh, yeah, and then of course, I, I started actually at home. We would cook and, you know, open a glass of wine uh, with friends and just sight read the early Haydn quartets, you know, which is mostly on the viola. Uh, tonica and dominant so uh, it's a it's a good way to learn the clef and it's still glorious music 
and uh, you know one thing led to another but uh, to come back to your question it has influenced me and it is influencing me so much because imagine you know when you are a kid and you learn all these Sibelius, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich, Prokofiev, whatever all the standard uh, concertos you are so overwhelmed by just simply you know you're like in a in a labyrinth you know full of uh, you know trying to find uh, your way and trying to, to to manage the piece and 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 the older you get and for me especially when i started conducting and now starting the score and i must say to to my regret when i was a child learning these concertos i should have been learning it with a score with a okay. full score but i didn't and now that I know exactly what the second trumpet and what, what the trombone and what uh, uh, the second uh, bassoon and God knows who, you know, depending on the piece. But now the piece is a different piece. I get to experience all these concertos and actually I'm doing quite a lot of, uh, uh, not just, you know, not just conducting with uh, my wonderful violin colleagues, but uh, doing a lot of play direct and even with pieces like the Brahms Violin Concerto, without conductor, the Tchaikovsky, Prokofiev Number no. Two, I'm it's still challenging, thinking. It's challenging to do those concertos without. I'm, I'm thinking about Shostakovich One. I'm still not sure about uh, the second movement, so I'm a little hesitant about that. But yeah, like really doing even the romantic concertos like Schumann, like. Um, like uh, obviously Mendelssohn, uh, Mozart, the classics, but it's a completely different experience because for me this piece and my solo part becomes so uh, so much less important in a way. It's integrated into the the whole picture, right? It's a symphonic work. It's a symphony with solo instrument. Yes, it's the violin who stands in front of the orchestra, but it's. The feeling for me personally, the goal is to play chamber music. And I don't need, and I had this conversation with, I was very lucky to still catch the great uh, uh, Mstislav Rostropovich as a cellist and do quite a lot of chamber music with him. And, but also, you know, play with him as a conductor in this and also trying not to miss any possible concert of him. And especially in the end of his life, so maybe the last 10 years, that 10, 12, 13 years that I got to know him very well, he didn't want to play loud. He hated to be loud. And we are often taught you know, you need to play, you need to project in the hall and this. And, and I know, and partly this is my personality, but the older I get, the less I'm interested to project or, uh, or, or, or to be heard or to, to have the goal to, to, to be very, very loud as a solo. And so I remember Rostopovich, we were in India together, he invited uh, Zubin Mehta invited Rostopovich to do the Dvořák and me to do the, uh, what was it, the Tchaikovsky concerto, or was it Beethoven, uh, alternating nights, on alternating nights. And we went to India, which was an amazing trip. And I arrived in India after Rostropovich, and Rostropovich already played a couple of concerts, and Zubin came to the airport. And so Maestro Mehta welcomes me, which was very sweet of him, uh, and I say, Zubin, so how was the concert last night with Slava? And he says, oh my God, don't ask me. The rehearsals were, uh, I've played this piece, the Dvořák cello concerto with him for over 40 years. And he tortured the Maggio Musicale, the Florence Orchestra, where Zubin was many years music director. He tortured my orchestra for five hours with the Dvořák concerto screaming at us that we are too loud. And we already played with one hair and nobody, there was no more orchestra. And still he kept screaming that we're too loud. 
And the same happened to me. I was lucky to play the Shostakovich, some of the Shostakovich quartets with him. And uh, also um, a bunch, the, the world premiere of the Penderecki Sextet, and quite a, quite a lot of the Arensky Quartet for two cellos. So quite a lot of chamber music. And he was screaming at everybody that we are all too loud. And, you know, maybe I am now exaggerating and, 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 and but I want to make this strong point. For all these great violinists out there who want to make big careers and who feel that, that, that they are great players, Listen, take the score. Don't do the mistake that I did. Take the score and view it as a composition. View the concerto as a symphonic composition where you need to listen. I remember there is one passage in the Mendelssohn, second movement, you know, where, uh, I don't remember, some wind instrument has the theme and we are just playing... You know, and I had a lesson on Sibelius with Rostopovich. And he was telling me, What are you doing with your octaves? You know, because it was playing. He said, Nobody needs your bloody octaves. Excuse my swearing. But he was very intense when you had lessons. And um, so I guess. He was one of my big heroes in music, and uh, I took this from him, maybe, and uh, subconsciously or consciously, I don't know. But this is a little bit a uh, message to the young, wonderful uh, musicians out there. No, it doesn't matter which instrument. It's listening like the motto should be, we play a concerto like we play chamber music. And of course, we are going to play... <laughs> Of course, we're not going to play this pianissimo. Of course, we need to be strong, but we also need uh, this... Um... We need to take a little bit back, you know, and not just, you know... It's not enough. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. It's, a, it's really wonderful that you been uh, talking about this because I think everyone should remember that uh, the music ca came originally not f for the 2000 seats concert halls. It came from very intimate atmosphere and where people were sharing new premieres and they were playing for their friends. The composer was sharing in the small rooms with the candlelights. And I think we really should remember this and trying to bring this intimacy in our interpretation and share it with the audience because this original doll music is a singing so uh, mo most of the music it's a it's a human voice right we try i think uh, as violinists we are as close as nobody else to the human human voice i mean although yeah i mean the cello i love the cello anyways but still the violin is the king of the string instruments or the queen and uh, and we have the possibility to sing on it and, and as you said I, to tell the story is also a great a great advice you share to tell the story through your playing so singing with words right <laughs> music is an abstract art and we can really explore much more and take the liberties because of course we need to respect the structure we need to respect you know the composer's wishes the rules uh, the form and you know all these hours of hard work that we all have to do you know to just purely technically master any work whatever it is even uh, an easy piece is never easy if you want to, to, to do it well. That's why I am very much against the word easy. You know, when I'm asked, what is an easy, uh, do you know an easy duo for whatever, violin and viola or two violins? I mean, what is easy? 
I mean, of course, you can have the attitude that it's easy. This is easy. But I don't like it. Um, you know, to play even... I mean, it's Mozart. It's from, it's from the gods. And yes, maybe it's not as difficult as a Paganini caprice or first violin concerto by Paganini or uh, Isai 6. But... But you have to be virtuoso in order to play this. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. So thank you again for this wonderful talk. And so we have another performer waiting to be performing uh, Aaron Kaplan Sonata, which I know you know very well. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Emily, right? Yes. Yes. You are wonderful. We don't have so many great students in Austria, where I live. <laughs> um, so everything is very, very good. Intonation is perfect. Bow control, sounding point, everything. But the most important thing is missing. So, this music, I, I'm hearing it for the first time. I love it. I think I want to play it. It's beautiful. You are inspiring me. So, please, let's, let's play it again. There are, I saw one fourth, the interval, A and D, which you played Senza Vibrato. I think this music you can find some more places where you completely, you know, I want to inspire you also a little bit like the student before, like uh, Yun Mai, to explore much more interesting colors and atmospheres, you know? Whatever comes, I think this music allows you to, to do something with it, not just to play everything correct. I remember having a conversation with uh, a composer that unfortunately passed away, uh, is it now one year or one and a half years? Uh, I'm sure you know him, Krzysztof Penderecki, the Polish great composer. I don't know if you played anything by him. and. So we were great friends for 20 years, for the last 20 years of his life. Or, or, yeah, 20 years, pretty much. And when I was playing his, uh, uh, his works, and I, I, I worked quite a lot with him as well, with him conducting or with him in the audience and in the rehearsals. And it's always interesting to speak to, to composers because most composers we play, we can't talk to them. And I was playing his second violin concerto. I was preparing it for my New York Philharmonic debut with Lauren Mazel. And I asked to travel to him uh, so that I can work it with him prior to going to New York and, and, and doing my debut with, with the Phil. And he wrote this piece for Anne Sophie Muta. And he was a composer that wrote very, very clearly everything into the score, you know? I mean, pretty exact. And so I'm playing the piece uh, to him and we're going through it and he suddenly stops me and he says, why are you playing here uh, with a mute? What is this? I said, Maestro, it's written Consordino in the score. He says, yes, but that's not for you. That's for Anne-Sophie Mutter. <laughs> and it continued like this. He said, why are you playing so, so, so uh, this passage uh, so, so uh, like, uh, witty and alive and uh, and vivace and 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 and, and, uh, and scherzando and this i said because that's what's written he said but that's not for you i said but maestro how can i guess what you like or not the only reference i have is what is written in the music he said listen i tell you something and of course i cannot speak for beethoven and for Copeland and for everybody else, but working with quite a few alive composers, I have learned the following. And Penderecki kind of nailed it. 
he said, Julian, the only thing that I want besides you, of course, respecting what is in the music and okay, fine. In this case, we have the possibility to discuss, to take the mute off or on or this. These are small parts, but, and this I want to give to you as a little advice. Now I'm going to stop uh, talking and you're going to start playing, but um, the general message which made a very big impact on me back then was Penderecki saying, all we want as composers, we don't want one interpretation that is the right one. We don't like one interpretation. We are writing a piece of music and we want that the whole world, that all the people are going to play it or as many people as possible if they like our music. And the only thing that will make us happy or that makes us happy is to have the artist make a very, very convincing interpretation. It has to convince me. He said, change the tempi, play senza vibrato if it's written con vibrato, take the mute off, take it on. I mean, of course, we are not gonna go so extreme. And of course, if, if we play a piece and it says with mute, we are most likely gonna play it with mute. But the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto second movement, 90% of the people play it without mute, right? But you can't play it with mute because he wrote it consordino. Well, what I'm trying to tell you is, please take more liberties. Because the composers, the music which is in front of you is just a sheet of music. Yes, they are our gods. They are the creators. The composers are our creators of this incredible music. What would we do without them? On the other hand, the composers without us only have strange, weird signs that we call music notes and notations on a piece of paper it's dead and we need you need to put it through yourself through who you are and you are the you are completely entitled because you are such a complete and wonderful musician that there is no danger you're going to do something stupid and crazy and completely you know uh, sort of destroy the peace or the meaning of the peace. But please take these chances and take and, and, and find those extreme colors in the music. Because the music tells you something. If you didn't like this piece, you wouldn't play it unless somebody forced you to play it. <laughs> Emily, please try now. Let's try from the beginning. I don't have the music here, unfortunately, so I, I, I can only stop you and give you a, a little bit, some, some, some ideas, uh, but, but try to, to go a little different direction and go outside of your comfort zone or what you're used to do. Listen to your inner wishes and feel free to transmit them to us. Without knowing the piece, this is much too concrete, like in the Strauss Sonata before. Da ra ri ra. No. What what does it say? Is it piano? What does it What does it say in the music? Piano freely singing. Freely singing piano. Here we go. There is nothing happening yet. Yeah, you are just continuing the chords of the piano. 
Sometimes it's wonderful to do nothing. It says a lot. And not tararira, not healthy playing. I am against healthy violin playing. Because you have it. If somebody doesn't have it, I'll tell them, I need real violin playing. You have it. Nothing. Go on the fingerboard. Use a lot of bow. Maybe vibrato, maybe not. Up to you. Do something very, very special. about Emily Emily can you start Dumbo and now and now start with one hair and at the fingerboard don't start ta -ra -ri -ra. Can you play this fragment? Not exactly in rhythm, a little bit freer. Yes, very good. Yes, yes. And when something repeats, more fantasy, different. La ri ra ra da ra, la ri ri da da ra. When something repeats twice, three times, find a different language because when we repeat a sentence, we never repeat it the same way in life. And in music, it should be the same. On the E string, first position, you have a few G's. Use different bows. T, pa, pa. Do something with these G's.
Exactly, bravo. It, it's much more interesting right now what you're doing. Um, just a technical thing. For this piece, it's fine because it all works. And again, I don't want to, although I'm going to do it, but normally I don't want to interfere if, 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 if it works. But in general, for different repertoire, be careful. There is a golden rule that I grew up when I was a kid, when I started playing violin. The, the very first rule that I was taught, and I vigorously uh, believe in it. The first finger, and this is not for now, but just for something to think about when you will play really difficult repertoire. The first finger, le left hand, never leaves the string, ever. If possible, because this is the foundation of our playing. This is the foundation like you build a, a house. You know, a house needs to have a foundation, otherwise it's going to fall apart. It can be the prettiest house, but it's going to fall apart. So everything to do with intonation, with stability, the first finger, don't have it in the air. Now, if you practice it like this, then you are allowed to break the rules. Don't think about it now, but I just wanted to mention it because I, uh, listening to the first movement, I see a lot of this. And for this piece, there is no problem at all, as I said. But in general, please keep your first finger at all times, whenever possible. All the great violinists do that, except of the ones who don't. <laughs> It was very good. Wherever you stopped, you can continue. And continue, continue coming up with ideas. This music lets you do it. Please, a sonata is always the most difficult, except of string quartet, to do a whole sonata evening. Imagine you are two hours on stage, just you and the piano. This is not playing a violin concerto in 30 minutes and, and you are done. You need to take the audience on a journey. You need to tell them a story. And we need to feel this story. Like you're reading the most exciting, interesting book. We want this thriller. We want this novel. Whatever it is, tell us your personal story. You were doing great. Continue. <laughs> It's very good when there is a lot of detaché, like now. You use always the same amount of bow. I think that the music, you can shape it. You know, don't use, it, it sounds a little bit like an etude. Yeah. There must always be some kind of a direction where you want to go, where you want to lead it, and try to use not exactly the same bow. It's like in Brahms concerto. The same thing here. Mix it up. Put a little variation on how much bow you use.
about we do three piano once. Vari ra ra ram vari. Try. I think this can be more special. This now I can I remember. I think it's a little bit uh, you're like thinking of something, you know. Not um, Try to find these colors. Empty note with a very small vibrato. Do you see my hand? Hold on. One second. It's just very small. Also the angle, I think you have a very good angle, but maybe for the, for everybody who is watching. We are always taught to play parallel to the, to the bridge, right? The bow. Were you taught to play parallel to the bridge? Yes, so was I. So I came up in the last 34 years, or maybe even, yeah, well, maybe in the last 34 years. I came, I came uh, to a conclusion that if this is parallel, if you take the bow a little bit in this direction, I'm exaggerating now. So you cut the cake like this. Never, never this. This is your track. And you have two possibilities to get this angle. The first possibility is to put the upper arm to the back. Look what happens then. Right? Exactly. So, the upper arm. This is one possibility to get the angle because many violinists, if they want to play something very expressive, they do this. Sound disturbance. I believe it's like a train track. Once you have this, and not completely parallel. Take it a little bit this, this direction. A little, just like this. So as I said, the first possibility, let me try, I hope you can see it, is this. This part, the upper elbow back. The second possibility, because everybody is built differently, is the violin slightly to the left. Look what happens. Also you get the angle. Yeah, so you have these two possibilities. If we do both, it's also much too much, right? But never this. And again, I see that this is not a problem, but I just want to address, because it's an open masterclass, I just want to address a few technical things. 
So, and also what I see with you, although you're very, very free and very relaxed when you play, you can use your pinky a little bit more and your fingers, yeah? A little bit, a little bit more finger work, yeah? And this, the second knuckle, do you see the knuckles? These are our knuckles. The second knuckle in. Do you see this one? In. In. Flat. Only think of the second knuckle. But not the wrist. The wrist is normal. You have a great wrist. Everything is very pretty flat. We don't need this. This is great how you do it. But second knuckle. This whole thing, look. This is the suspension, like in the car. Yeah, for example, if you want a soft chord. I do a bow change before. And I push the second knuckle in. So. a bow change. I make a bow change before I play. Before I play, I don't play like this. I don't start like this. I start like this. Yeah? So a little bit more flexible, little more second knuckle in and fourth finger. Pinky. Sorry, that was just a little bit dry information. Look what you did. You did. And I, you need the C. Yeah, you need it. I know that you will tell me, but the E will sound much more free if the first finger is not on the C. I know that, but maybe just for demonstration, yeah? And first, before you play the G, the first finger is already on the C. How you find the C? It's the easiest. And now, leave much more bow for the last note. Too. And speed up the bow at the end. Speed up the bow without crescendo. Just release it. Speed up the bow. You have two notes, E and C. How much bow for, for the first note? How much bow for the second note? The second note, always much more bow. Even if you emphasize the first note, But never.
when you are alone, maybe in the beginning of this phrase, senza vibrato. And then warmer towards the end. Just as a suggestion. Until where I stopped, go back. Yeah, much more interesting. Yeah, go always back in waves. Yeah, it should not be a ritenuto, but just take it, take it, take it, take it, a little bit. Very good. <laughs> on the first note, on the first finger. You know, a vibrato can also be just... It doesn't have to be. Not obvious. Come on. The F's also. Mm. Mm. 
Much more interesting, every F. Yeah? Let's go. Vibrato. Change your vibrato. Yeah, wrist vibrato, finger vibrato, elbow vibrato, and then also... Uh, yeah, much more interesting. When you have param param, the small notes, orim pirim barim, whatever the music is, yeah. Not don't focus just on the long notes that they sound nice. The small notes, orim pirim orim parim. Not knowing the piece, but I think this can be really soft. Flautando. I'm just playing anything. Yeah. Very tender, tender, tender. four phrases they all sounded a little bit the same or was it three phrases yeah can we do this you have it a few times please surprise me every single time Yes, and Emily, maybe not here, but please try to also have this kind of vibrato. Not just... Well, really small amplitude and very fast. Add it to the repertoire to your vibrato repertoire, yeah? Thank you so much. Wonderful playing, bravo.
Cool, and it was amazing two hours. It, would, uh, it, it seemed like five minutes, but you were so descriptive and it was such an in-depth teaching and also whatever you were saying, sharing your experiences, it was, I think, it was very valuable. I'm sure everyone, uh, all attendees enjoyed this session. We talked about, we discussed the possibility of you coming here. It didn't work this time. Perhaps in the future, you'll be able to join us in person. But I really have to thank you and I have to tell you that uh, I've been following your, your musical career and all your different projects. I think you're just in, in, in incredible artists. And what is really inspiring to see how you're still developing new ideas in every performers every performance you present it's always exciting very genuine and uh, i think it's something one should uh, really admire in your approach to the music because you make every performance very exciting and alive so I thank you so much uh, dear dimitri and uh, for me the most important thing is just for all of us to stay curious and to never think that I mean, it's nice if we do a nice concert and, uh, and we should be happy and proud. But the next day when we wake up, we start from zero again. And to keep this curiosity going, a lifetime is not enough to, to become a great musician. So this is what keeps us going. This is why we choose uh, to dedicate most of our lives to music. And it's the biggest... Uh, privilege all of us so thank you again for doing these incredible uh, master classes i've uh, been uh, just scrolling down the list of unbelievable musicians that uh, you managed to inspire and i'm sure with this uh, wonderful level of musicians uh, we don't have to worry about the future of classical music thank you i appreciate it very much I also would like to thank our wonderful uh, professor of psychology, Lauren Harris, who established special funding to bring such artists like you are. And then we have a video audio crew today helping us, Tyler Young, Ivan Harris, and some of the students, uh, uh, Alirna, Natasha, and Sandro, they've been real help. So we hope to see you here in person. All the best to you. And again, thank you. Thank you very much. And stay healthy, everybody. See you soon, hopefully. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.